Hi there, my name is Laura Madsen, and I am a protection officer with UNHCR working on cash-based interventions. And today we're going to talk about cash-based interventions and protection. So the objectives of today will be to define CBIs and to be able to identify its various forms. To be able to use protection risk and benefit analysis tool to inform the response analysis. Or in other words, to decide the appropriateness of a CBI as a modality of assistance. And to be able to distinguish between protection mainstreaming, protection integration, and standalone protection programming as they relate to CBIs. So why do we need to think about protection in CBIs? First, I think it's probably important to define what we mean when we're talking about protection. The Interagency Standing Committee defines protection as encompassing all activities aimed at obtaining full respect for the rights of individuals in accordance with human rights, refugee law, and humanitarian law. Protection can involve either removing individuals or groups from a risk, threat, or situation of violence that may adversely affect their fundamental rights or freedoms or intervening at the source of the violence to stop or reduce it. Protection is important in CBIs as it is in all sectors where humanitarian actors have a responsibility to place this protection at the center of humanitarian action. Protection priorities need to be captured in the humanitarian response plan. Humanitarian country teams are encouraged to develop a comprehensive response or protection strategy that can provide the framework necessary to address the most urgent and serious protection risks, as well as to prevent and stop the recurrence of violations of international human rights and international humanitarian law. So what are cash-based interventions? CBIs refer to all programs where cash or vouchers for goods or services is directly provided to beneficiaries. In the context of humanitarian assistance, the term is used to refer to the provision of cash or vouchers given to individuals, households, or community recipients, not to governments or other state actors. CBIs cover all mod modalities of cash-based assistance, including vouchers. This, however, excludes remittances and microfinance and humanitarian interventions. Although microfinance and money transfer institutions may be used for the actual delivery of cash. So CBIs are not a program, but one modality for a humanitarian response alongside in-kind distribution, service provision, technical assistance that helps to achieve programmatic results, such as enabling populations to meet basic needs. They're typically used when target populations are facing an issue of accessibility to goods and services due to insufficient resources and other barriers that limit their access. The advantage with CVIs is that they use local markets and service providers to meet the needs of affected populations. So provided that uh, markets are well provisioned and can scale up its supply when faced with increased demand, CVIs might be the preferred intervention modality because they inject money into the local economy. If populations, however, are facing an issue of availability of quality of goods and services, the provision of cash or vouchers might cause inflation due to insufficient supply, in which case you might want to reconsider um, in-kind or a combination of CBI and in-kind. So key terminologies in CBI. Conditional and unconditional cash. This refers to whether a condition must be met before a beneficiary may obtain the cash or the voucher. This could include things like cash for work, attendance at training, bringing children for doctor's checkups, depending on what the objectives of the program are. Restricted and run unrestricted cash refers to how money can be spent. Restricted grants are typically provided through vouchers, which limit the expenditures to certain places, for example, at grocery stores or selected traders, or commodity. So an example of that would be a voucher worth X number of kilograms of rice. Restricted CBIs are usually adopted when a program requires that cash be spent on specific commodities or services. However, this commodity or service is not necessarily the highest priority of the target population. Unrestricted cash grants will usually be spent on the household's most urgent needs. 
And finally, we have cash delivery mechanisms, which refers to delivery mechanisms of how beneficiaries will receive the cash or the voucher. So this could include physical cash in envelopes, bank cards, electronic vouchers, uh, ATM cards, mobile banking can even be an option. Key considerations when selecting the transfer mechanism include local availability of services, distances to services, access including safety, and service costs and speed, and ease of setting up the mechanism to be used. So now we'll talk about conceptualizing protection vis-a-vis -vis assistance. The Interagency Policy on Protection describes protection in a continuum. And we start with uh, protection mainstreaming on the left, to protection integration, and then standalone protection programs. In the Guide for Cash for Protection and Cash-Based Interventions, this continuum is applied specifically to CBIs. But these are the general definitions. So protection mainstreaming is an imperative for all humanitarian actors. It's a way for designing and implementing all programs so that protection risks and potential violations are taken into consideration. To mainstream protection, actors need to understand who is at risk, from what, or from whom, as well as why, and the consequences of their actions. Protection integration involves incorporating protection objectives into the programming of sector-specific responses to achieve protection outcomes. Integrated protection programming requires all humanitarian actors to commit whatever feasible and appropriate to protection objectives in the design of their activities. Standalone protection programs are managed typically by protection actors and humanitarian actors with a protection expertise. They play a role in ensuring the implementation of specialized protection activities in specific areas. Uh, with specific objectives to achieve protection outcomes. So what are the most important considerations for designing programs where protection principles are mainstreamed, protection risks are detected, and mitigation measures are put in place? So protection must be mainstreamed throughout the CBI program cycle. In programs where protection is mainstream, protection principles are incorporated into sectoral interventions with an objective to meet one or multiple basic needs, such as food security, nutrition, shelter, or livelihood support, where cash or vouchers are used as the response modality. Examples of mitigation measures for protection risk can be put in place to include, for instance, Risks related to safety and dignity, fraud, theft, acceptance of cash as suitable modality, social relations, and others. So this slide represents the CBI and protection risk and benefit analysis tool. And it's a very simple matrix with protection areas noted on the left-hand column as safety and dignity, access, data protection and beneficiary privacy, individuals with specific needs, social relations, fraud, and market impacts and access. These areas are typically defined when we're thinking about protection risk, but they're not fixed, and they could be adapted depending on your context. And the matrix takes you through different steps in terms of identifying which risks are apparent within those protection areas. The different community-based protection uh, prevention or mitigation measures that could be put in place, prevention or mitigation measures that can be put in place by humanitarian agencies, benefits, and then the decision as to whether you're going to use a CBI uh, in-kind assistance or no response at all. We will go through an example of what this looks like when you're actually conducting the analysis. So in the first instance here, we have safety and dignity. The protection risk that is identified is theft and looting or extortion. 
And then there's a column that discusses what the evidence says and is this the risk specific to CBI. And in this case, no, in-kind assistance may be more visible and is typically less portable than cash, making it an easier target for theft. A 2013 UNHCR WFP review of the evidence on CBIs and production found that risks for theft and manipulation are not exclusive to CBIs and can be alleviated with a good program design. In the column of humanitarian agency mitigation measures, you can find measures such as implementing complaints and feedback mechanisms for beneficiaries to ensure that they have a channel to report any kinds of issues that come up. Two-way feedback mechanisms between communities and humanitarian agencies, involving individuals and households and communities in assessment and design can also help to mitigate risk before the implementation of a program. Clear information and two-way feedback mechanisms with beneficiaries, whistleblowing mechanisms, and swift agency response to report fraud or corruption. The potential benefits of using CBI in this case include the dignity of choice, assistance according to personal or household preferences, to be able to purchase exactly what is needed, an increase in participation and the accountability to the beneficiaries. And CBIs also, also in this case offer a low visibility and a discreet nature to deliver assistance, which could be in the form of um, mobile phones or a bank account, so that individuals aren't identified um, as receiving res um, assistance perhaps on their different vulnerabilities or selection criteria. And the evidence about the potential protection benefits and outcomes include improvements in household economy. They do not necessarily have lasting secondary effects on women's health, empowerment, or social connectedness. So that's an example of uh, one analysis for one area of protection. We're going to move on to protection integration and CBIs, and we're just going to give an example here of a study that was conducted in 2016. The mixed method study on the causal mechanisms through which cash and in-kind food transfers decreased intimate partner violence. It was a WFP program. Uh, six months, cash, vouchers, and in-kind food support in northern Ecuador were provided to beneficiaries. And it was conditional on participation to monthly nutritional workshops. So this example illustrates protection integration because it's a program that has uh, food security and nutrition objectives, but it also incorporates a protection objective, which would be to decrease uh, intimate partner violence. The study looked at different pathways, the causal pathways in which uh, the decrease in intimate partner violence took place. Um, based on a theory of change. But I think for these purposes, just understanding that there are two separate objectives within the same program gives you a good understanding of what protection integration looks like. Standalone protection activities and CDI. So this is the third type of programming that we're going to talk about, and it's based on a study that was carried out in 2016 called Integrating Cash Transfers into Gender-Based Violence Programs. The specialized protection activities or programs have specific protection objectives, as a reminder. They aim to help to prevent and respond to protection concerns such as violence, exploitation, deprivation, or discrimination and to support beneficiaries to enjoy their rights. So this example is um, was a UNHCR commission study in Jordan that examined a program where cash assistance was designed as a tool to build resilience to SGBV within the SGBV response and prevention program. Protection and empowerment activities were complementary to the goal of mitigating GBV risk. And cash assistance was identified as a needed intervention because of the high correlation between exposure to SGBV and the lack of financial resources. So 170 to 250 USD 
per month for at least six months is provided to refugee women. In addition to psychosocial support and gender discussion groups for male and female household members. The key findings of the report demonstrated that cash, in addition to gender discussion groups, can result in decreases in domestic violence. And cash can have a short-term life-saving use. Lasting effects were only found as a result of the psychosocial services and discussion groups. And cash facilitated participation in markets and feelings of safety due to social interactions. So as a recap, how can CBI contribute to the reduction of oops, how can CBI contribute to a reduction of protection risks? We have a couple of examples here to just give further illustration. Cash transfers used to provide food assistance must provide safe distribution points to ensure that no further harm is experienced by those accessing assistance. As an example of protection mainstreaming. Another example of integrated protection programming includes conditional cash grants for education, which could contribute to increasing primary education in addition to reducing early marriage. Another example of integrated programming includes um, economic pressures that are contributing factors to GBV, such as safe access, stable housing, or lack of access to basic income. Cash transfers might reduce the risk to GBV by providing for basic needs and uh, shelter options. And finally, a standalone protection program could look like a cash transfer that might address aspects of GBV, where core GBV response services, such as legal services, health services, are not accessible free of charge. Cash could therefore be a key aspect of a survivor's recovery. In this way, cash might be used as a tool within case management. In the case of GBV, it's particularly important to have close and intentional collaboration between GBV and cash actors when implementing these kinds of programs. The coordination of CBI. With the endorsement of the Inter-Cluster Coordination Group's Terms of Reference 2017, the responsibility for cash coordination has been placed at the ICCG to ensure strategic and streamlined cash coordination throughout the response. As per the Terms of Reference, the cash working group has formally gained a space within the humanitarian architecture as a, sub, as a technical sub-working group um, of the ICCG a service provider advising the intercluster coordination group on cash issues and accountability. Clusters have an active role to play in cash coordination. The clusters have to develop their own guidance on how to provide assistance within their sectors, be it cash in kind or mixed. In accordance with 2015 Interagency Standing Committee Coordination Handbook, to plan and implement cluster strategies by developing sectoral plans, objectives and indicators that directly support realizing the overall response's strategic objectives is one of the six core cluster functions. And this brings us to the end of the webcast. Here there are some links that help you gain further information if you're looking to mainstream cash or mainstream protection to cash based interventions or tools that can help you manage and monitor integrated protection cash programming. So there is the UNHCR WRC Guide for Protection and Cash Based Interventions. A protection, the protection risk benefit analysis tool. Recently released is a WRC toolkit for optimizing cash based interventions for protection from gender based violence. And then the GPC has a number of tip, sheet, tip sheets on cash for protection for each area of responsibility, which includes child protection, GBV, housing, land, and property, and mine action. 
And finally, IRC has a Safer Cash Toolkit. Should be coming out this year. By using the right tools for initial assessments and ongoing monitoring, we can contribute to mitigating risks and achieving protection outcomes. We can mitigate any associated risks like gender-based violence with the right programming components and the right approach. I hope this webcast has been helpful and has provided some information to help you integrate protection into uh, cash-based interventions. Thank you very much.